So just to give you some context, so I'm 28 years old. Uh, I start, started to work 5.5 years ago, something like that. Uh, I studied management right away after university. I went into consulting, classic, nothing, uh, nothing special in this. I was quickly bored at Capgemini uh, because I always wanted to create my own company. I thought I would learn something uh, there, but uh, it wasn't the case. So I was wondering what kind of stuff I could do to learn as much as possible to prepare myself to become an entrepreneur. And I found out that sales would be a good start, basically. So that's why I went to ETS Consulting as a business manager to try to start selling consulting services to big companies. So to go on the other side of the barrier. And then I found out basically that uh, I didn't like to, uh, what I was selling. And it was very important to like what you sell. So I left Intis Consulting and I went in Africa for one year and a half at Rocket Internet. So I don't know if you know Rocket Internet, but it's a big German company that is incubating a lot of startups. And their business model is to copy successful American, most of them, business models and execute them into emerging markets. So I went to Nigeria for six months, I went to Cameroon for four months, and Congo for five months. Launching different businesses, uh, first one was an hotel booking platform, and the second one in Cameroon and Congo was something like Autoscout 24, so second and cars platform. I was fed up of Africa after a year and a half. I thought I, was, I had you know, taken what I wanted to take, so I came back in Belgium, and I wanted to work in a what I call a true startup, because Rocket Internet is, such, is so big that you are an entrepreneur, but basically you don't have to worry about raising some funding, for example. You don't have to worry too much about online marketing, because everything is centralized in uh, Germany, for example. So there are a lot of pieces in the puzzle that are missing. You, you start to build your own experience, but there was something missing. So when I came back in Belgium, I wanted to work for a company with true entrepreneurs that are from scratch and take a risk, of course, that uh, my bet would be a fail. And the reason why I joined Take It Easy is so just to, to explain you a bit what it is. Take It Easy is a, is a food delivery startup, or was a food delivery startup. Um, and what, they, what the, the interesting thing they were doing, basically, was that first they were doing delivery themselves. So they had their own um, uh, logistics, built-in logistics with bicycles. And the second important thing was that we were selecting some specific restaurants and not working with everyone. And since I was in Africa and we had some, space, uh, some, some similar models in Africa, I had experienced them and those models were not doing the delivery themselves and they were not selecting the restaurant. And it was always a disaster because the customer service was never following up. You always had your food late, uh, wrong packaging and so on. So it was a disaster and I thought this would be the solution. So I took my chances, I made a bet and take it easy, and I was the first manager coming into the company. So here you understand a bit better the dynamic of take it easy. So we are in the middle. So basically, I was working on the restaurant side. So I had a team that was responsible for chasing restaurants, signing them, and then retaining them in the company. On the other side, of course, you have a customer that is ordering food, that was the marketing part, and then you had the couriers who were which was the logistic part of the company, and each of those areas were managed by someone. And then on top, of course, on top you had product uh, CEOs and so on. So, the story is: uh, I joined November 2014 the company. At that point, the company was only in Brussels with seven people, and a month before I was coming in the company, they expanded, <coughs> expanded in Paris, and at that point we only had 500,000 euros on the bank account. Oh. They raised 500,000, but there was no 500,000 remaining, of course. So um, two months after I was in the company, Rocket Internet suddenly called uh, the CEO of, uh, of Take It Easy and said, you have a nice business here. We would like to invest. Surprise, surprise. Four years later, we raised 6 million euros from uh, Rocket Internet. So it was not my fault, of course. It was, uh, I mean, the, the life went on like that. But it was uh, interesting to see that Rocket Internet basically was choosing a business that, uh, that I, I joined after leaving Rocket Internet. So at that point, it's, very, the, it's a very um, 
interesting experience you can live. Because you are not the entrepreneur who is taking the risk, because you have not put any money on it, or you have not spent three to four years trying to build up your um, product market fit. But you can experience the huge growth of the company because you are going to spend a lot of cash to hire a lot of people. You have to uh, find them, you have to train them, you have to build the processes, and you have to make sure that it is aligned with the rest of the business. So I spent starting six months after I joined the company, roughly 10 months traveling across Europe to build up the business. So we expanded aside Paris in other cities in France. We went uh, in Madrid, Barcelona, uh, Berlin in Germany, and London. So in each of those areas, we had to set up the business from scratch, and we had absolutely zero, uh, zero bases there. So this is what my team uh, achieved. It was uh, composed of 70 people at the end of the experience. When we raised money, we were at around 400 restaurants. And at the end, when the company crashed, we were at more than 3,000. So this is the results of all our efforts in recruitment processes and so on. So it was going in the, in the good direction. But uh, the question is why, why we have paid, basically. So um, I already had an introduction about, about the reason, one of the main reasons it failed. It was because of the fierce competition we had in the market. So it's a business model that is working, but you have very, very tiny mar margins because each restaurant, we are charging them 30% of the turnover they were making with us. So an average order was around 30 euro. You take 30% of that. Best case, if you negotiate well, you have 10 euros that you will retain from the restaurant. And you have to pay minimum, um, it was 5 euros or 6 euros per delivery to pay to the courier. So you see, you have very tiny, tiny margins. There you have not paid the employees, you have not paid the marketing, you have paid nothing. So when you <laughs> face a big competition like Deliveroo, the game is quite strange because, so six months after I joined the company, we raised six million. Five months after, we raised another 10 million. Why? Because our competition, Deliveroo, had raised 70 million euros. So we had to raise a bit more money to be able to at least compete a bit with them and hopefully spend the money in a better way, get a significant result, and raise more than them. That was the game, that was the bet, okay? But it didn't work out because uh, it was a business that, is, that was scaled at a pace where you could not focus on efficiency. Why? Because you have investors on one side that, says, that say you, you have a lot of money, but the only thing we want to show to the next investors or to our current investor is we want to show traction. We want to see the, the others growing as fast as possible, we want to see as many restaurants as possible, and uh, we want you to make as much noise as possible, and this is the only metric that we focus on right now. So when you start to do this, of course, you stop thinking, and you start spending too much too fast. The result is that you have a lot of growth, but you don't have profitability. And that was okay at that time, because that was the investors were asking us for months and months. So we've been building on that and having a huge growth, and everybody was happy. But when, when you start to raise money at the beginning, we, call always, well, we always speak about Series A, Series B, Series C, and so on. And the bigger you move on to the fundraising, the bigger you have to raise. So if you have raised 10 million with some investors, maybe you will not raise, the same, if you have to raise more money, you will not go to the same investors, you will have to go to bigger investors. And Six months after we raised the first millions, uh, we had to raise money again, because at that point, so that was six months before um, we, were do, we were about to do bankrupt, we, to, to go into bankruptcy. And so we had to raise money again, one, why? Because we were spending two million euros a month. So the bank account is uh, dropping pretty fast. And if we had to compete again with Deliveroo, we had to raise not 5 million, not 10 million, but at least 30, 40, 50 million. And so when you go, when you, you want to chase investors, they will put that kind of money, 
Uh, you, you need a good story, which is yes, my, my business is going very fast. I can compete with Deliveroo. I can, uh, I can, uh, I can uh, create my own space. But <clears throat> at that point, six months before the bankruptcy, the venture capitalist market started to shift, and most of, most people were thinking, are we in a bubble or not? And so nobody wanted to fund a company that is well, not making profit. Right, problem. So that was six months before the bankruptcy. So for three to four months, we started to do the hard, trying to find a hard equilibrium between keeping the speed and increase the efficiency of the business, trying to show that we're able to make some money to satisfy, to satisfy the next investors, and so we could raise money and continue the story. And then you have your friends Deliveroo raising more and more and more money. And so it starts to become quite tricky. Even if you have a business that's growing very fast, and you start to make some money because we were starting to make some money. Even that was not sufficient. The story was now, will you be able to compete with those guys who, even, who, um, who at the end of the day have much, much more money than you? And just to give you an example of the game we were in, when you, as a sales representative, you were going to a restaurant in any kind of city in Europe and you wanted to convince them to go and take it easy, you could be sure that before you, or just right after you, you would have a sales representative of Deliveroo coming into the restaurant and proposing, for six months you can work for me for free and I will not you ask you any commission. How do you want to compete with that? How do you want to make a profit, uh, a profit out of this business? Still, we started to, to work on that and we started to make some money out of it. But the game here was not about who has the best service, but who can afford the loss as long as possible. Because as a business, if you propose a restaurant six months for free, of course they're not making any money. So the strategy was clear. It was to kill us because we have more money to lose. And so that, that starts to become a tricky game. So this is just an overview of uh, what we have we achieved in, uh, in one year. So when I started, we were seven people. At the end, we were more than 160 people across all the cities you see on the map. And three months before the bankruptcy, we had a term sheet, as we call a term sheet, from an investor willing to invest 30 million euros. And it was a uh, Geopost, so it's uh, a subsidiary of uh, La Banque Française, uh, pardon, La Poste Française, um, so the French Post. Um, and that was at the, end of, at the end of May, this term sheet was supposed to be sealed into a contract and we'd receive this money and, and continue the story. But when the subsidiary CEO had to sell the story to the, to the big guys in the, um, uh, in the, in the, the headquarters, uh, they said no. Uh, we don't want to play that game, it's too risky because Deliveroo has raised too much money. And at that point, uh, we had no money left in the bank account and, um, and no more leads to, to um, to, to seek some money to. Because all the investors, the, the founders of the company, saw so 200, more than 200 investors trying to raise that money. And only one accepted to put 30 million. And the only one you have said no. But you are burning 2 million euros a month. So at that point, we, the, the goal was to sell the company as fast as possible. So the current investor decided that we had to cut all the, the cost, marketing cost spent nothing. Just, <coughs> they, give, they gave money just for one month, one million euro to pay the salaries <coughs> for June. And then the, the founders had three weeks to sell the company, more or less. Luckily, at the end of June, so that was last June, uh, so one month before the bankruptcy, um, <laughs> we had a big problem because Deliveroo at the end of June <coughs> did an offer. And it was the, not the first of offer they did. Just before, we were, a year before, we, were, we received the first millions. They, they came to us and said, oh, we know you are going to raise some money. We will buy you for 15 million. The founder said no. Um, and at the end of June, one month before the bankruptcy, they came back and said, 
we are glad to offer you a new offer, 15 million. That was nice. Because at least everybody could you know, save, uh, everybody could be safe, everybody could have uh, the salary paid at the end of the month, that nobody will be hurt, the company would merge, and that's it, end of the story. And then you will have nice newspaper stories saying that Take It Easy has been bought by Deliveroo, and, uh, and that's it. But then you have the Brexit coming in. And the Brexit means that a lot of uncertainty and um, the, the, the price was going higher because the, 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 the pound was going down. So of course the, the price increased. And they were also in the process of raising money. Deliveroo was about to raise money. Because of the Brexit, they were, they, they, they were scared of not raising this round. And they knew that Uber Eats would come after. So they had to raise a lot of money. So they said no. You are at the end of June. You only have one million to pay the salaries. In three weeks, you are bankrupt. And uh, nobody know or imagine a clue about the story in the company. And you have to say nothing, otherwise it's complete bad. Um, at that point, I left the company. Um, I work as a freelance. Uh, the risk was way too high. I knew I would never see any, any penny at the end of the month. So I took another project. That's my last slide. But um, for the, la the last three weeks, the founders uh, went to several investors. Uh, they received an offer, a very small offer, but still an offer, the day before the bankruptcy, and then they say no. And the day after, they filed for bankruptcy. And it was a surprise for everyone because nobody expected that a company that is growing so fast, that has so much traction, so nice culture, so many people, everybody was talking about us, that the company would go bankrupt. Everybody was imagining, in, uh, um, was thinking that the founders would succeed. And so it was a shock. That's why I put this slide. <laughs> so, it's a very long story. Uh, I could talk about this for, for hours. So I would be happy to answer your question if you have some after. Um, for me, failure, so of course it's, it was not my company. I've, I've, not, I've made some money out of it because I was paid during that period. I had stock options that of course were zero, so I made no money out of this. Uh, but when you work so hard on a project like that and you go bankrupt, it's always a kind of failure. And so you have two options for me. Either you say startup are not for me, this, this is the proof that it's too risky. And so I would rather go into a more classic path and go back as a, a more established company. Or I consider failure as the only way to succeed. It's part of success. And I have to continue until I, I succeed. That is my choice. So I left uh, Take It Easy. Uh, for months, I saw that you had opportunities in the medical sector. I saw that you had a lot of companies growing very fast in France. Um, two of them, especially, called Dr. Lib and Mon Doctor. And what those companies do is that they do partnership with doctors medical practitioner, uh, so <coughs> general practitioners, uh, uh, you say dermatologists, surgeons, and so on, any kind of medical um, uh, practitioner. And what they offer them, what we offer them basically is uh, a platform where they can have an online agenda. They put their availabilities online. And you can book right away as a patient that is going on the website. I'm looking for a dermatologist in Mechelen, for example. You, you, luckily for you, we have a partnership with one of them. You see the availabilities, you select the availability, you make the request, everything is automatic, and you don't have to worry about anything. So that's the project I'm working on right now. And last December, we raised one million euro. So hopefully, this one will be a success. And this one is not a success, I will do another one. <laughs> so that's, so that's my approach. So for me, uh, I consider failure as a prerequisite to success. And um, the best example I can give you is that when you were a small, small baby and you started trying to walk, you didn't succeed the first time. You had to start again, start again, start again. Like everything you do in life, you have to, it's a complex, it's a complex, um, creating company is complex. And so unless you are super lucky or you are super smart, don't expect to succeed the first time. It's obvious. 
So you have to be prepared to fail. That's not, that's not because you know that failure is a big, has a big chance of being at the end of the, of the path that you don't have to try. But you should at least try and know that maybe you will have to do another project and another one until you succeed. That's my approach to, to failure. So thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvain. Uh, when your competitor raises 275 million, mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel as, as a manager of Take It Easy? You, you know immediately, okay, this is it, it's over? Uh, yes and no, because um, you know you know the metric of your of your business. Uh, you know you know how it goes. You you know where you come from. You know what you've been at, been able to achieve. So yes, of course you are pretty scared. But we were everybody believed until the very last day that we would succeed. I was very proud when I saw the, the ads in the metro system of Barcelona, of Take It Easy, by the way. So uh, I thought the same thing. But, um. but that was, for example, a stupid way of you know, spending money. Yes, it's very nice. And that's why I think Take It Easy received so much uh, attention, because it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you consider the, 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 cost, the cost of this, it's not super efficient. Do you think it's possible to um, grow with a company, to scale a company like Take It Easy uh, when you're a Belgian company? Because Deliveroo is a British company, it raises like 275 million. Uh, I've never seen a startup, a Belgian startup or a Belgian scale up even raise uh, 275 million. So is that possible when you're. Uh, Showpad Show is doing pretty well, no? Yes, Showpad is 50 million, it's not 275. It's much more than Take It Easy. So, so yes. the, the point, the point, uh, the point I want to make is, uh, I agree with you. We don't have a lot of stories like that in Belgium. And it's a pity, but um, I, the reason I think Deliveroo uh, uh, succeeded at the end, uh, yes, of course, they had a lot of money and they spent the money pretty well because it's all about that spending the money in a better way than a competitor <coughs> to have more traction. But in the end, if you think about it, uh, when I when I joined Take It Easy. Deliveroo was a small startup in, uh, in London, and they only had raised five million. At that point, we were not even thinking those guys would become our biggest competitors. And one month before we raised the first six million, they raised 25. And then, then you, see, you see the gap, basically. In six months' time, if, for example, the founders of TGTZ had a better market fit six months before Deliveroo, they, may, they would have maybe been the first to raise the, f the first five million, and it would have been a reverse situation. So in my opinion, you have this factor, which is a kind of a chain, a chance. Um, and the second one is uh, Deliveroo had indeed an advantage because the founder is, is was older than the current founder of Take It Easy. Those guys were 28, the guy was, what, 37, something like that, and he had worked all his life in investment banking. And he was in London. So yes, of course, if you want to chase big guys, for investing a lot of money, I think he had an advantage that we didn't have. It's still <coughs> yeah. And how did uh, the Belgian tech ecosystem react uh, on the failure of, of Take It Easy? What was the general feeling after after the failure? Well, nobody, as I, uh, it was my slide, nobody expected that uh, it would happen. Um, for me and for many persons in the company, it was not a surprise because we were <laughs> checking the bank account every day for six months, so we knew exactly what was happening and what was the probability, probability of succeeding. But a lot of people, it, it depends on the kind of people you are talking about. Uh, the managers, most of them understood that it was a tricky situation, even, even, even that some of them were not really believing in the, in the odds of failure. But many people that don't understand the logic behind were much more surprised. And it's not about the surprise, it's the way it was communicated. Because what the founders wanted, basically, is never say something negative or try to create fears into the company to, to keep people alive and working as hard as possible to, to make the company work. And that was their approach, and I understood it, because if at the last minute they were having some chance, then it would have been complete success. But they took a risk, they said nothing, and, it was, and that was the shock, and some people felt that uh, it would have been nice from them 
to communicate that you, we might have a chance to go bankrupt. And so if you have financial troubles, you should maybe look for another job. And that was the, the, bad, I mean, the biggest you know, issue we face at the end. Okay, thank you. Do we have some questions, some last questions uh, in the audience? Yes, one over there. Good evening. Uh, your presentation was very interesting. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, from your experience, do you think competition leads people to success? So, if I understand the question, do you do I think that competition? Yeah, like uh, the, from from uh, deliver and uh, take it easy. I understand those guys were making so much money so fast, and you guys could not keep up. So, I'm wondering if competition leads people to success, or you just have to meet a target or something. For me here, the 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 odds were against us because, as I explained, they raised money six months before us. And that, and that gap, if the money is spent well, of course, if they had raised five and they don't spend the money well, then of course we have a chance. But if you have someone that is starting before you and is doing well, then the, the, the difference will always stay the same or even increase. And that's what happened to us. It, that's, that's the reason why it was so sad at the end, is because the, the, the business was succeeding so well. And the, the only reason we didn't, uh, uh, we, we went bankrupt is because the gap was so big that nobody believed that even with 30 million, we would even be able to succeed. That's the sadness of the story.